my name is Matt Fry from UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. I'm really very pleased to be hosting this uh, first webinar in our AI Environmental Science Series, which is uh, supported by NERC and the Constructing a Digital Environment Programme. So the, the programme aims to develop the digitally enabled environment, benefiting researchers, policymakers, businesses, communities and individuals alike. Yeah, so this is the seventh series of a fantastic um, set of webinars that the programme has been organising. And in this one, we'll be considering the role and opportunity, as well as some of the pitfalls in the use of AI in environmental science. Um, so the format of the webinars is, is to have a presentation, invited presentation from um, leading experts in the field, followed by a chance for um, Q&A afterwards. So um, just to give a bit of background to the program, um, advances in digital technology have led to a rapid increase in the volume of data being captured, curated and managed on a daily basis. And alongside this, New technologies have enabled a step change in global capacity for integrated monitoring, analysis, modeling, and visualization of the natural environment at potentially transformative spatial and temporal scales. So by harnessing these advances in technology and, and the UK's leading position in both environmental observation and computer and data sciences, um, there's an opportunity to create a digitally enabled environment. And this is something that can be achieved through approaches such as integrated networks of sensors, so in situ and remote sensing based, together with methodologies and tools for assessing, analyzing, monitoring and forecasting the state of the natural environment at higher spatial resolutions and finer temporal scales than previously possible. So uh, the program's done a huge amount of work in this area, um, including the seminar series through a range of projects um, and other activities. Um, but yeah, so can I um, invite the audience, if you haven't already, to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So you can see that at the bottom right of the slide there. Um, if you haven't done so, so you be, be able to see all the talks um, to date and the, the upcoming talks will be put on there as well. And I think um, Josie's going to paste the link in the chat as well. So, yeah, a, this series is about AI environmental science. So it's the seventh webinar series focusing on the development, use and application of artificial intelligent techniques in environmental science. So AI tools are enabling new analytical value to be delivered from existing sources of data, as well as providing powerful tools for gathering new data. So the webinar series is covering activities across all areas, across these areas, and we're trying to bring in lots of different areas of environmental science and lots of different kind of methods, methodological approaches. So we've got some really fantastic talks coming up over the next um, couple of months. So please keep an eye on the, uh, the program as it, as it um, continues. Um, so today's presentation, the first, is, is from uh, Dr. David Topping of the University of Manchester and the Alan Turing Institute, and he's, he'll be talking about AI in environmental sciences from research development to underlying infrastructure and policy implementation. So David's research interests focus on building computational models of atmospheric aerosol particles for use in interpretation of measured properties and as submodels for incorporation into climate change models. So the research area is highly multidisciplinary, covering physics, chemistry, numerical methods, and computational science. Um, in addition to that, to that, David's work includes evaluating how machine learning might mitigate existing complexity bottlenecks in atmospheric modeling, experimental data analysis, and impact assessment. Uh, David collaborates on methods that combine both air pollution data and human symptomatic responses. And he's also co-director of a new program to develop underlying infrastructure that will connect environmental data with other domains and thus support th further development of AI and associated movements, including digital twinning. So in terms of the uh, questions and answers, please feel free to post any questions into the Q&A section. You should see the button at the bottom of the form rather than the chat, so um, in, the, in Zoom. And we'll collate these after the talks. Um, and I should also note, yeah, we're recording the talk, so thanks, Josie, for that. So, um, yeah, without any further ado, um, over to you, David. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Matt. And hi, everyone. Um, so I will share my screen, go through the um, steps to get this up and running. One second. Um, OK, so. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, yep, okay, right. so I'll begin. Well, it's, it's a real pleasure to be invited to give this talk with a ridiculously optimistic title. I think we could, we could have many talks covering different aspects of, of, of this, these sets of slides, um, but it's certainly an, an accelerating area of interest. And one I think that is key in, in looking at, at the round in terms of taking environmental science into the next decade and even longer, I think we all appreciate that the, um, I guess the direction of travel 
uh, that we face as re a research community and the pressures that are on us and the people we wish to benefit from our tools are changing and the timescales are changing. And thank you for the introduction to myself, Matt. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I'm a physicist by trade. Um, I did a PhD in atmospheric science, what feels like a long time ago now. Um, and really my movement into the data science sphere, I guess might follow many of my colleagues in the community in, in that from a scientific perspective, I became quite frustrated that we had this increasing complexity in physical and chemical understanding um, in the atmosphere in particular. And, and really, we'd hit barriers with regards to how very robust traditional tools were, were, were unable to start to integrate all of this complexity and, and really truly understand change. So is data science able to capture that and take us forward? Um, like I said, the talk does have a particularly broad title, uh, and I'd like to break it down into four areas and really hopefully hear your feedback on, on all of the above. Um, the aim is to provide a view of this end-to-end -end process that integrates AI in environmental science domains. And I'm using end-to-end -end processes and similar terms interchangeably because I think the drivers that require implementation of data-driven services at the policy interface will help us rethink what we need as a research community and then the requirements we need to request in terms of our support and technological development moving forward. So in the first area, I'll briefly talk about broad developments for AI and environmental science. Obviously, there's hugely exciting developments in this space, and, and it's great to see that this webinar series will present some of those. This can only be brief, um, but I want to frame it in the sense of moving on to the second, third, and fourth sections of the talk, which, which aim to prevent this end, provide this end user perspective. And as, as an example, in the second section, I always think it's nice to use cities, environment, and net zero as a really interesting and fast-moving case study that bring together the academic and non-academic stakeholders that are already placing questions on the responsibility we have to deliver new insights from a research environment to an active policy implementation. I think the third area follows where we think about our community and reassess the importance that we place on underlying infrastructure. And infrastructure is such a broad term, but specifically, I want to think about digital infrastructure um, and, and how this brings with it an ecosystem that we sit in as researchers, as active scientists in this field. And finally, looking to the future, Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, it is absolutely bright and exciting. I think we just need to reassess what we value in terms of that supporting infrastructure without seeing this as any barrier to innovation. And I think we can start framing some of those conversations in a really useful way as the people who understand the science behind this area. Um, so for the first section, AI and environmental science, it, it, we've known for a very long time, environmental science covers many spatial and temporal scales. We already have a very diverse set of data-driven challenges. Um, my head is still in the early 2000s, and yet a paper from 23 years ago, I think summarizes quite well. Uh, way before broad narratives around AI integration in environmental science were, were, were hitting all of the platforms that we expose our, our, ourselves to at the moment. Of course, that, that narrative is about the importance of data and our human role in environmental change, which ultimately requires a multidisciplinary approach. So breaking out of these traditional research silos. The data science process on the right hand side is one we're all familiar with. It's what we're trained to do, you know, as scientists from, from undergraduate level upwards. But perhaps perhaps we haven't referenced it in the same way. So our, I think our narrative is changing to take a data-driven approach. Collecting data, cleaning data, understanding data, using insights from data to tweak theoretical understanding, develop new models, develop new insights, and then revisit the need to generate more data. That has been obviously fantastically effective. You know, it's got us to the point where we know the impacts that we're having. These are evidence, they're visualized, they're delivered, they're delivered to stakeholders. I guess if I was being controversial and of course self-critical one might say that these traditional approaches have perhaps been too linear 
and required connections between too many silos that often happen through chance uh, or, you know, um, evidence of serendipity yeah, occurring through communities that work closely together. I think emerging data science methodologies could perhaps seem to short circuit some of these processes. That sounds very negative, but of course, as we understand global change, we're under increasing demands to arrive at solutions quicker, and these solutions have to be robust. When we talk about AI uh, in any area of science, we do often reflect on the volumes of data, heterogeneous data that need to be integrated into decision-making at scale. Uh, and the increased frequency of these solution requirements um, and the, the heterogeneous nature of data we have access to, all often with the facets of big data, are placing new constraints on us. Um, I like to reflect on my own experience, where from a numerical modeling perspective, in many cases, a mechanistic framework that joins an environmental process with associated impact simply doesn't exist. Some areas are perhaps even easier to consider in this, in this regard uh, than others. Perhaps, again, in, in my own particular case, linking policy intervention through environmental change, through human health outcomes, this seems like a perfect use case for data-driven techniques to be used. And in the list of bullet points, provide some, some more examples here, such as the fusion of Earth system observations from remote sensing platforms, the, the requirement to deal with unstructured data, and of course, the cross-linkage -link with some social economic systems. I guess at the moment, we could reframe some of that. And an interesting narrative that brings some of these challenges together is, of course, this pathway to net zero. And whatever we think with regards to whether that term may exist in a few years, it's already leading to you know, a range of potential interventions to be formulated. And questions that frame these interventions are important in the sense of understanding where data science could be used to connect, for example, improve health, health outcomes with a climate policy, whilst we try and under, avoid those unintended consequences of change. And I think so let's again another example within the atmospheric and air quality sphere we want to avoid a diesel gate right in, in rolling through these local interventions and whilst it might have traditionally been hard to pull together the evidence base to inform those rapid decisions can ai and bro more broadly data science help us uh, um, in this regard and this requires a multidisciplinary approach we often talk about this all the time and delivery of that approach can be challenging uh, we often focus heavily on model development when it comes to AI, whether it's deep learning or, or more traditional areas of machine learning. But what I'm trying to get at in this talk is it absolutely is going to be essential to embrace broader data science movements, but we do need to consider the underlying data infrastructure from metadata standards, trust, and, and then think about how we then reframe our own infrastructure as scientists. Um, as we continue our environmental research projects and programs, it's always interesting to see the direction of travel with regards to new technologies and how they may become more widespread and more accessible to us. If you're not familiar with the Gartner hype cycle, um, every year this is published in a range of different technological disciplines, and it gives a, a qualitative schematic of the um, progress from a point of innovation um, in terms of a particular technology, how a small community takes that technology forwards to the point where you reach a point of inflated ex expectations as that technology becomes more accessible to a broader practicing community. We, we actually really understand the true use of that technology as we approach what's called this trough of delusionment, you can use that term interchangeably for a Monday as well. And then eventually we actually raise the expectations once again, and we realize that actually the true use of the community through practicing scientists and perhaps policymakers. The reason I've put it here is because I think obviously um, there are some really interesting directions of travel from the 2022 report, 2023 isn't available yet, I think it's around June, June time, we see reference to um, accelerated artificial intelligence automation. Of course, hot topic at the moment in the present climate of large language models, 
But what does this mean for us? I mean, in this area covers causal AI, which identify uh, and use cause and effect relationships to go beyond correlation based predictive models. We see transformer architecture models, such as the large language models, generative design AI, also known as AI augmented design and machine learning code generation. Now, of course, it could be a very long time before some of these tools become widespread. But actually, when you look back through subsequent years of this hype cycle and what's happening in the environment space now in terms of research publications, we're already using some tools that were, were actually pointed out a couple of years ago. So it's interesting to see where we might head. But again, I, I need what I'm thinking around in terms of this talk is, is what we need to do as a community to embrace it, but embrace it in, in, a, in a trustworthy and, and an effective way. So there are obviously some really exciting examples on the use of AI in peer-reviewed literature through the community. Uh, so adoption of these emerging data science methodologies, for example, monitoring technologies in the environment can integrate onboard classification models. Uh, here is a basic example that we were involved with where a Swiss company has developed on the back of industry standard deep learning architectures. So again, there's some really nice examples of transfer learning approaches and an ability to detect airborne pollens in real time, replacing the slow, studious approach of manual offline classification and daily concentrations. And by connecting the outcome of that classifier to a real time database, we were able to deliver interesting and important um, information on pollen to people who might be interested in associated health outcomes. So this is a good example of that end-to-end -end process we talked about before, and the nice interplay between academia uh, and, and industrial development. In 2019, um, you'll have all probably seen this slide um, figure before. There's a fairly seminal paper presenting a commentary on machine learning integration being the key to, ta to, to taking large-scale models to the next generation. So models that can integrate diverse data sources to deliver new insights. This is such a broad area of development. It requires shifting paradigms in terms of the programming environments we use. Do we want to rewrite all of our large scale models in another language? These languages that can integrate machine learning and process models in a single framework, thus moving to physics informed systems and increased trust. And on the right hand side, we see a fairly contentious diagram, but nonetheless, one that I think presents a schematic of the interplay between black box, gray and white box models to deliver new insights, hopefully driven by the push to explainable systems. I don't necessarily agree that black box models necessarily produce high quality results, personal opinion. But again, I think it shows what we're doing as a community is being pragmatic whilst being cautious in integrating effective technologies in a unified way. I think I'm in a safe audience here to suggest that there's perhaps more positive movements in that space from applied scientific domains than you otherwise would see from some fundamental publications. <laughs> um, more examples, so uh, choice of machine learning architecture to deliver a particular problem is, is, is of course requires testing effective outcomes according to the question you're trying to answer. But now we're already seeing the use of automated workflows that do this for us. And this slide was provided to me by a colleague who's been using auto machine learning, which is a community package now being co-developed with Microsoft, I understand, to, do in to integrate different components of remote sensing data. So the product is much larger than the sum of its parts. Here using um, multiple, inf um, multiple data on trace gases to improve predictions of PM 2.5 from an existing um, global model. And this itself is interesting on a number of levels because in theory, it could remove some of the programming requirements from a, a domain scientific perspective, whilst of course requ still requiring we test and validate in a robust way. And I think it also shines light on our ability to increase the value of extra products that we capture. Um, and in this case, um, therefore, you know, revisiting what we want to further invest and continue investing from a monitoring perspective. Um, we see examples of crossing those multidisciplinary silos that were otherwise quite difficult. And this is an example of work that we were involved with through the SPF Clean Air Program, uh, which develops uh, the data integration model for exposure 
This integrates data on daily travel patterns and activities with measurements and models of air pollution using agent-based modeling to simulate daily exposure. What we have on this slide is the prediction from the Spencer model that was developed at the Alan Turing Institute used during the COVID response. To understand by, uh, by LSOA, where people spend their time by demographic and age group. And then of course, once you have access to that information, you can map that onto predictive pollutant fields or measured, measured fields and really break down the predicted, and I, I clarify it's a predicted uh, personal exposure estimate by micro environment. Massive caveats here in terms of the availability of data in those environments. But again, it shows an, it shows an example of that workflow in developing a framework that can frame predictions in a, in, a, in a way that's useful for people who have to think about effective policy implementation. And of course, we could go on. There are many examples. In this graph, we see a schematic that captures the different facets of data science, and we can pinpoint really interesting developments in our own environmental sphere, from machine learning and deep learning, such as methods to identify extreme weather events, land use types, or developments of physics informed models to really target that bottleneck. More broadly, when we talk about AI, we're not just talking about model developments either, but obviously integration of insights that deliver those through those models in an automated way. And there are large global developments in this space. I've just copied an example here from the recent United Nations report talking about um, programs to design more energy efficient buildings, to optimize re renewable energy and so on. Supporting all these developments, there's a family of methods on, on the bottom left from semi-supervised learning through to probabilistic models, generative methods and so on with the associated family of programming environments. It's important to keep an eye on that domain knowledge requirement and we need to retain this as we move forward. One critical component of this slide, however, is, is this idea of the underlying infrastructure. I think it's now relatively easy, I say that in quotation marks, for at least programming researchers to access fairly complex machine learning libraries and move towards development of new models. But when we talk about environmental science, we want to connect our research with improved outcomes for us and the planet. And this is where I think the infrastructural requirements are really drawn out. So this is why in the second example, we look at we look at a use case with cities and net zero. Uh, the timescales for implementation of technologies and interventions can be really rapid in this space. And it's dictated by a broad range of stakeholders in and outside academia, <laughs> dominated outside of academia, perhaps. And in many ways, cities act as this theater for in very many environmental and societal challenges. And already uh, we see interventions being proposed and rolled out. Necessary interventions across these natural and social systems is often, however, frequently held back by this limited evidence base. This could be the result of insufficient data and also this understanding how individual systems interact with each other across sectors and scales. So there's pressure to adopt rapid solutions already. Bringing that scientific evidence to bear on understanding change is obviously essential. And we could do this manually with a collection of data science driven tools and existing modeling tools, existing insights. Here we have an example where through the development over many years of this living lab approach, uh, we were able to study the environmental change associated with the unfortunate progression of the pandemic with regards to, in this case, the improvement or at least change in air quality, a change that was seen to be associated with huge changes in urban mobility and activity. What this small use case demonstrated is what we're able to do is combine time series, so data-driven forecasting techniques driven by historical measurements of nitrogen dioxide, Combine that with access to data on traffic systems to look at what the concentration should be under normal operation. So this, 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 this slide is showing uh, the measured data in red, uh, the forecast data using that traffic data in green, uh, and then the forecast data in blue, assuming normal operating conditions. What we found that was that um, even um, where these new data-driven modeling te techniques were not able to correlate the measured concentration with the reduced traffic, existing modeling techniques helped us, of course, tease apart 
This complex interplay between potential changes in local interventions and what can't be controlled outside of a regional boundary. And it was essential that this, you know, we framed the insights from these tools using current understanding of the, of the scientific processes involved. Even at the individual level of instrument response functions, data science methodologies that have been around for a while helped us confirm source changes in particulate matter when total levels didn't change. We saw increased signatures from wood burning, garden waste wasn't being collected, people were burning their garden waste in the evening, there were major moorland fires, and also there was changes in the traffic nature, there was an increased ratio of HGVs as we were starting to order more things online in the morning, despite the heavy reduction in total traffic. Of course, this is all well and good, but it's desirable to automate this, this similar type of workflow so that more agile developments and insights can connect scientific grade tools to people who can implement change. Here we see the rise of digital twins as a general narrative. They're providing an alternative narrative to this infrastructure we've built so far. And on the right hand side, we see a useful diagram that differentiates data flows between physical and digital objects, where the digital twin is a fully connected data flow and is able to implement change in the physical object. Digital twins have existed for a long time, of course, in the engineering sphere, such as work around jet engines and predicting risk. But now we see lots of conversation. And I'll have to say some of it probably a little bit too optimistic when we look at the natural environment, um, in the sense that we need to understand the value of near to real time data and the changes that can be made on both human driven and natural systems. But there are some interesting potential uses here. Air quality and health outcomes could be an interesting development particularly in controlled environments like indoors, when you can imagine connections between building ventilations, activities and air quality and the like. And of course, digital twins could be used to play back multiple scenarios to simulate potential impacts before implementation in the real world. So this is an exciting development and it's absolutely gaining huge momentum. So it is taking us down a direction of travel, whether we like it or not. We need to embrace uh, where it might be of use. But we now, even with a digital twin, we have a range of examples where perhaps controversially, I think it's safe to say that open data by itself is not enough. And we can even stretch this to potentially interesting outcomes on tools built around this open data if we don't have appropriate provenance. We already have examples at the local environment and policy interface where we see in this example, provision of data streams provided by a third party provider that was openly available. Uh, because, of course, environmental science, AI and digital twins is not just seen as a development that we can control in academia. There are solutions that are being built that provide potentially quick answers to local policy providers. And this was simply a case of an air quality data stream that had been made openly available during a low traffic neighborhood scheme because we'd found it, it was it was the data stream was just not right. It had zero um, provenance. It was taken offline and it completely locked out community groups and the local council authorities. It further so sows um, distrust and pushback against appetite for delivering interventions that are ultimately designed to benefit all. So I think this moves us nicely onto this realm of discussion, discussing supporting infrastructure in this broader AI and environment sphere. I'm really excited by the development of new tools. I'm not convinced we fully appreciate all the infrastructural needs, particularly if we're talking about the interplay for implementing change. And I'm not suggesting this is something we all need to take part in, because of course, it's very easy to talk about infrastructural developments. This ultimately requires huge amounts of software engineering, architectural design. But I think we do need to review about how we value maintained data platforms and agreed metadata standards. For example, are there enough robust labeled data sets out there if we're developing new models and digital twins? What are the standards that need to follow? And of course, this is an interesting landscape in itself. Um, the Urban Observatory team did a project last year and a, an, an ongoing project as well for the Department of Transport. Uh, so Urban Observatory is an EPSRC funded initiative, and we did a review of metadata standards and data accessibility at this interface of, of, of environment and mobility. And of course, you find a very mixed bag, and this can vary by region. I think a nice outcome was it seems that the environmental sector at least 
is one of is one at which the adoption of metadata standards has occurred to a considerable extent. But again, it doesn't seem to go together with open AIs that everyone can access. Data that could be accessible through a series of steps, steps by es established academic researchers like ourselves doesn't necessarily translate to easily accessible data by all. And I'm sure we have our own um, examples we could talk through here. So I'm going to use this to kind of uh, 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 sneakily move on to an, an exciting NERC funded program um, that we're, we're, we're involved with here. Uh, that will hopefully be, be of interest to this audience. Uh, the Digital Solutions Hub is a program to tackle some of these issues in partnership with the fantastic work that, of course, the NERC data center, centers uh, have championed for many years. So we're looking to connect the UK's environmental data with data in the public and private sector. And this moves us away from having data sets that are only accessible for academic research but we're really trying to understand how we make this data more accessible to all. And of course, this has to come with everything we've talked about to this point. One of the interesting features of that program that requires us to connect environmental data with health data is the development of these trusted research environments. And we're aligning our work with a huge body of developments and programs in this space, such as HDR UK, and the features of TREs are really essential, essential to winning and maintaining public trust, where we look at data quality, security and transparency, and transparency. And of course, this is important in not just health data, but other data that might be seen as sensitive. And some environmental data does fit within this category. I think we'll end up reflecting on this more as we move forward. But what we're hoping is this will help to provide this underlying framework where solutions can be developed to develop new data-driven models and maybe digital twins. But underneath has to be that academic robustness, data quality control and stewardship. We're already speaking to partners across the UK and I thought this audience might be interesting in some of those outcomes given the title of this talk. We've already got some important insights. And again, for me, one of the really interesting roles from AI in the environmental space is that connection to policy and practice but what we're finding is we absolutely do need to strip this back a little bit. You need to think about this basic data science infrastructure. In many cases, you know, active policy partners in the public and private sector do not know where environmental data is or who controls that data. From a health perspective, it's seen far too removed from clinical practice, and yet there's high interest from public health officials. And these insights alone help us think about how we deliver this supporting infrastructure to make sure environmental data is particularly useful for people sat in these outside of academia. Some really, and again, some really important insights, quite depressing insights as well, is this basic lack of access to latest versions of software, outdated hardware, locked down versions of laptops. We're talking about integrating AI informed solutions. Who looks after those solutions? Because obviously you need an appropriate software and hardware environment to, to enact those technologies. We're not quite there. Other insights, of course, we gain from yourselves uh, and the very active research community that, that brings together environmental science and developments of, in, in AI. We have the Alan Turing Special Interest Group, and I'd like to reflect on some of the insights we, we, we've, we've gathered from that. Uh, initiative. Uh, it's a great interest group. We already have nearly 500 mem members um, from across the UK, from universities, public sector and industry members. This interest group is based around four challenge areas from nature-based solutions, climate adaption, resilience, pathway to net zero and that linking digital infrastructure. And we're really keen to understand how do we use this um, platform that brings everyone together to really facilitate the identity of environmental data science? Because I keep, keep talking with, about the two as separate, but this should be a, a, a new area of, of recognition, I think, as active scientists. We had um, a face-to-face -face workshop early last year, and we saw presentations, again, that showcase this really exciting work uh, between the environmental science domain and AI from crop type classification to um, uh, understanding urban topology from satellite imagery through to framing narratives around digital twins in, in, in really um, interesting environmental uh, areas. 
But we also asked the community what it thought the opportunities for AI and data science were in reaching in particular net zero, not only from a positive perspective, but also from a negative perspective. How might this negatively impact on our ability to reach net zero? And there were some really interesting insights, uh, and this will lead to a, a commentary paper that's being put together at the moment. Uh, there were some obvious statements. We've talked about some of them here. Reframing our methodological focus on old and new problems, developing these hybrid methods, new model developments. But of course, we then talked about the potential impacts of that. Uh, we've seen many narratives already talking about the carbon footprint of AI by itself. And perhaps the not so obvious insights that came from this meeting, which are really interesting, is this conversation of, of having to make sure that we embed sustainability by design. And again, this, this makes us ask important questions about do what are our required training platforms? Do we have access to low power compute facilities? Do we need improved funding in this space? How do we make this attractive to people who have these emerging talents? You know, this workforce expansion on the, the interface between environment and AI, are we in competition with more with better paid jobs effectively? How do we make this more of an attractive space for people to come and work in? So there's a lot there, but where does this leave us? I guess if I was being a little bit blunt, we could ask the question about whether or not, do we value the slow and hard stuff? Slow sounds derogatory, I don't mean that. I think it's more, more in the sense of it is complex to make sure that there are sustainable platforms to support what we want to do. So this includes databases, calibration standards, and metadata. We talk about these all the time as scientists. There are potential software solutions to help, but we need the people to champion them. We need the people to manage them as well. I do think there is renewed vigor in combining mechanistic empirical model developments a um, lot of the challenges that I felt as a researcher many years ago in terms of, of computational bottlenecks, of course, the pathway to exascale and investments around that space perhaps will tackle those challenges. Do we always need machine learning to improve model developments? Perhaps not. But there's, there's already some conversations outside of the environmental sphere that pure machine learning representations are bound to have a limited shelf life. Whilst this is completely an irrelevant domain example, we had a really interesting talk from one of the Julia developers recently that showcasing programming environments where you can embed machine learning representations and process models in a single language solution such that the machine learning uh, model learns from the physics taking place. So again, it's all about in embedding more trust. So there's some really exciting developments there. I think we're finding that training is key and it's a heterogeneous issue. It's more than just downloading a software package, throwing your data at it and getting a result. One thing that I found in the data science space is there just simply isn't enough information on negative results. I think this again touches on the sustainability issue. If we're to repeat over and over again, processes that don't work, can we publish those processes? <laughs> and again, there are various interesting programming software environments that could help sharing workflows, containers, may help in that space. Um, we need to develop this attractive environment to build a skilled workforce. There, of course, is a big role for our relationship with big technology vendors. Uh, there might be brokers that can bridge the gap, the gap that we just simply don't have time to resource to work around. I don't think we can be responsible for all things, but we can start helping to raise this narrative more frequently that Infrastructure and regulation is not a barrier to innovation. And there's some, again, we're seeing really fantastic examples in the literature on the adoption of machine learning and broad AI, but at the policy interface, we need to make sure it's robust. And I think the research life cycle could absolutely benefit from this more sustained infrastructure. Um, the future, I think, is bright in the sense that, you know, we should look underneath uh, our own research environment and look towards graduate skill sets. There was an interesting, um, obviously lots of interesting papers recently talking about the need to um, consider software in the same way we consider laboratory environments. We're already seeing data science undergraduate programs, the MSc that we have here, 
the environmental science uh, pathway, which is one of many pathways of a data science MSc. There are over 5,000 applicants for that entire MSc. So obviously there's a really exciting movement. It could be that in five or 10 years time, some of these challenges uh, are being met. I thought it wouldn't be really appropriate if I didn't ask ChatGPT what its thought was in this space. So I simply asked it a couple of nights ago, um, does it think AI is going to drive the future of environmental research? Obviously, lots of really interesting data, some of the themes that dropped out. One thing I've highlighted at the bottom, which I think we all agree on, is that you know it is important to remember that AI is a tool. It complements our, exp our expertise, but the true success will still depend on interdisciplinarity and these well-informed policy decisions, which I think supports, hopefully, everything we've talked through here. I'd like to end on this slide if I can, because I think if you are interested in getting involved, with NERC Digital Solutions Hub as a program, you absolutely are welcome uh, as scientists, of course, but we do have some job opportunities. These are listed here. Um, just to very briefly comment on those, we're looking for a business analyst to map user requirements to the software environment, so the architecture we're going to need. And we're looking for a research associate in environmental analytics, so someone who has interest and experience in machine learning and statistics and developing tools that will sit on the hub to translate the data that we'll capture through this new architecture into insights that are of interest to our end users. And also some research software engineers, a lot of NERC's data is geospatial, not all of it, but we require some people who have expertise in GIS skills. And they have a particular closing date and they'll start as soon as possible. But I think I'll stop here and I'm very happy to take any questions. And oh, my video has stopped, hasn't it? I apologize. I didn't stop that. Um, it's okay, Dave. Thank you very much. That's excellent uh, talk and uh, wide ranging, loads of interesting stuff there. Um, so, yeah, as um, Josie mentioned earlier, please put questions in the QA because um, we've got time now for uh, to go through a few things. Um, there's a few points here one so I was interested thanks for the for the advert and the time we'll have to forgive you that <laughs> um interesting to see one of those was on uh was it re user research analysis mm -hmm. um so it's quite a different um set of skills that are quite um some you know they might see yeah on, on, a, on a normal basis so it's kind of interested in that um um some of the kind of solutions to the to these kind of complex complex um well use of these models and complex different interdisciplinary approaches um might need a different skill set in future so have you got any thoughts on you know what, what other types of things are needed in that area what other types of skills are we starting to need ethics communication skills those sorts of things yeah and, and you know it's it, i i guess what's going to happen in the same way that it's taken a while um and again thinking in in the broader sense of someone who's develops models, obviously there's been a, a huge movement around uh, software sustainability and best practices and making sure that you develop, you know, an appropriate workflow for sharing academic resource research so it's reproducible. I guess in the same way, there's gonna be expectations on practicing data scientists that there are appropriate things that you bring to the fore with your developments that are you know, appropriate for ethics, um, sharing and others. And also, I think it's maybe it's too much for individuals There could be supporting infrastructure to support that as well. Um, I talked about some of those um, workflows and containers being a particular area of interest for me at the moment. Um, you know, it, open open source code and open data, if I'm being honest, sometimes isn't enough. I mean, we all share our code. Who can run a regional model on a HPC system within an hour? I can't. You know, maybe you can, but you know, I think there's a whole ecosystem here. When we talk about people who perhaps want to take research forward at the the edge of acad our academia at the policy interface, that requires a whole different set of considerations, really. Yeah, maybe maybe we need to if we can't if it's too much to expect to have all those skills in our teams we need to make use of wider you know ethics yeah. they've always people 
if universities and things working on ethics and on communications, yeah. maybe they need to understand AI better to help us uh, yeah. get those get those messages across. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I, I'm not saying that everyone needs to work at that interface. We can't. There needs to be absolute clear focus on very hard scientific challenges. But at some point, there's a delivery angle uh, that's required. So still on that um, that kind of aspects of skills, you you mentioned you know, making it attractive to work in AI and environmental science. So have you got any thoughts on how, <laughs> well, both how, how we do that and then what, what maybe what the kind of um, research data science kind of intensive research team might look like or should, should needs to look like the types of skills? I guess it's interesting, isn't it? And I, and I, in some ways, I'm, I'm passing the book from a timescale perspective because I, it's not clear to me the current narrative that it's more attractive because people pay more in industry for skills at the fundamental AI inter interface is probably probably true. And I haven't seen the data, but it probably is true. Universities are struggling to recruit uh, technical expertise in certain areas. Um, that being said, I do wonder if, you know, some of these through automation of some of these tools, whether or not that's going to rebalance itself such that in the same way that, not myself, but some of us will know, need, know how to go into a lab and run a particular bit of a common scientific instrument, are some of these data science tools going to be part and parcel of a scientist's toolbox such that from the undergraduate level upwards, it's standard practice. Some of them probably will be, um, you know, and I think 10 years ago, some of the tools that, that we can now out access within a couple of minutes within a Python environment would have been very hard to develop yourself. So I, I think it, I, I think it's a mixed bag, this one. Um, I don't have a particular answer to it. Um, we, of course, have the benefit of solving worthwhile issues. I'm not saying that others don't in industry, but, you know, I, I think that will still remain an attractive position, I think, for people who come through the um, um, undergraduate system and want and want to make change, I guess. Yeah, no, I'd agree with you there. I think we've got, we do have a good, we're working in a good area of the environment that people see it as being worthwhile. And I think, yeah, I think if it, there's definitely more and more people coming through those master's courses and things with 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 some level of the skills. And I think it's just, what, yeah, how, that, that level, that depth of understanding that's, um, that's sometimes hard to get access to yeah. yeah so there's a question around um um you mentioned the the digital solutions and making NERC data more available um question about um this increasing amount of data from other data from other spheres so whilst the public data might be quite accessible but industry data may be even harder and harder to access nowadays and how do we how do we get or is that something we need to put effort into getting around I, I, it's, yeah, it's an interesting one. The one, the one good outcome from that program thus far is all the cam, all the questions we're asking, everyone's asking. Right? So data accessibility has not been solved, every anywhere else in in the broad sense. Um, there is absolutely true value in bringing data that we wouldn't otherwise have access to to understand science we're interested in. This brings with it um, the requirements around. Again, um, IP, uh, ethics, um, standards. But, uh, you know, that sounds overly negative. I think we're moving into a space where through programs such as this one, a researcher will be able to make those connections with partners outside of academia. And even if the data wouldn't be openly accessible to all, be able to delve into new insights through partnerships that otherwise wouldn't have been easy to construct Having data availability actually helps frame human conversations and brings people together. So it's not just about getting the data available. It's actually bringing people together over the data. So I, I, I'm quite optimistic in that space, I think. Um, and and I, it, I'm, it's important. I'm quite passionate about making sure that academia is in front and centre in that process, you know, bringing that academic robustness to those conversations. Because as I said before, if you take the city, smart city space, you know, the, the flux of solution driven technologies is staggering. And, you know, I think sometimes if you look at local councils who are pressed to deliver an answer in very short funding timescales, 
you know, this is where this is where we can get involved. I think that data accessibility hopefully will open up lots of those conversations. I live in hope. That's very positive. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, so there's a question around to you, around um, well, you met, where you mentioned data standards and metadata. So uh, what are the characteristics we need to have AI enabled data? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, um, this is a huge area. Machine learning ready data sets, I guess. Um, I think it's not just the data, it's the software tools that develops, right? Because you know understanding why a model will make a decision it's making sometimes leads us to certain machine learning architectures that you can interpret better than others this is a whole active area of development in terms of deep learning that obviously i'm not well best placed to comment on um there are existing ontologies metadata standards that the environmental space has adopted quite well i would say um so there are already positive movements in this space. I can't see there being, in terms of metadata standards, although someone correct me if I'm wrong, uh, brand new developments in this space. There are standards we can adopt. I think what we need to do is sit around the table and look at, have a review of the current state of that environmental data. And before we connect that data with new models that are delivered uh, to implement change, it's just a basic review of what we're missing in terms of metadata standards, provenance, calibration standards, who owns the data, other things. Um, so whatever models are developed, we can look back at the data that was used. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question in particular. I think I think it's just a, a huge area of work, but um, hopefully through digital solutions, again, we have the Turing involved to kind of help us think through what do we mean by machine learning ready national data sets? And what does that require? Great, thanks. So, well, this is one from me then. Um, mm -hmm. You're involved in um, monitoring data and approaches to monitoring. I just kind of feel that, well, I suppose there's monitoring for the sake of seeing what's going on in sort of real time. But in terms of research, when we do monitoring to kind of test models in the past, they've been process models, and maybe that's informed the way that we've decided how to do monitoring. Do you think mm -hmm. that? we might evolve the way we do monitoring to suit the kind of testing of AI methods or even the make or giving the data to drive AI methods? Do you think there's yeah. a difference there? I think there's going to be both, to be honest. I mean, I, I think, again, the, the simple example that I provided here on using, um, you know, a regional model to at least understand where the local data didn't sit our understanding from the data-driven model. That was a great example to me about how, provided you have access to those models, you can understand the broader sphere. I think it's going to be, I think the direction of travel seems to be, um, you know, to reach, to, to integrate the complexity we're now seeing through our monitoring platforms. I think the hybrid approach is going to have to be the one that we adopt. So, um, you know, process driven models are always going to be important. I think to take them to the next step moving away from the traditional parameterizations to embedding data science tools within those process models is where you see developments in non-environmental spheres. So particularly, for example, the medical industry, where there's been, a, in some cases, an outright ban on pure data-driven models because you can't tease apart um, the explainability outcome. And I think we can adopt, but again, do we rewrite our existing models? What what are the appropriate tools we need to enable that? There are also really some interesting developments in the US and Europe, you know, where large scale kernels are being rewritten in these new languages that will enable people to bring the process models back in, but then also bring in the machine learning tools to run alongside. Sounds like sounds like a digital twin. And there was a <laughs> question on 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 that. What what do we need? Um, what do we need to do to keep growing the role of digital twinning? I think we need to understand where they're going to be useful. Um, I think if I'm being on it, I think being controversial, I mean, I'd like to get the audience's opinion. What does the digital twin of the earth actually mean? I mean, I, I think digital shadows we do. Uh, I, can, I can understand the digital twin of a physical object we can change, but for many natural systems, I just I'm not sure at the moment we understand we're properly boxing 
where a digital twin will be absolutely game changing and where it will mean we revert back to models. <laughs> I, I, but I'm, I'm really interested in that conversation, and I don't, I don't have all the answers. But I, but I do think it's being used to interchangeably at the moment in in the environmental sphere. That's a controversial point to end on, probably, isn't it? Um, well, here, okay, here's one more, even possibly more controversial. Then, how how should future funding mechanisms from the research councils reflect the changes in science and technology that we need? Um, how can we? How can what can be done to encourage and foster these areas in our science? I, I guess if I was looking at this from an operational perspective, what I'd like to see would be various business models that would reflect the aspirational need of the community. So what, how much money would it take to fund people and processes in all areas and then a grade down from that? from our current operation through to that completely aspirational and then really work out, you know, what are the people and skill sets we need? Um, so what, how am I answering this question? I guess um, I, don't, I don't think we have enough headspace and time and resource from an infrastructure perspective. Um, I think this needs to be drawn out more because ultimately this will benefit the blue skies science moving forward. But it, I, I think it does require that economic breakdown and the community, community should take part in that, I think. Great, that's that's great answer, David. Thanks very much. I think that looks like that's probably all we've got time for today. So just, yes, thanks again on behalf of everybody. Uh, thank David Topping for your presentation and uh, for the discussion. So just to remind everybody that we've recorded the session, we'll make that available soon to watch again on the website and on YouTube. Um, just to remind you also, yeah, to subscribe to that YouTube channel, which will help us um, in the promotion of these series. So I think the link's going in the chat again, if that could go in the chat again. Um, and the next, so the next session, I think is in three weeks time. It's from Sari Gearing of, of the National Oceanographic Center and Rob Blackwell of CFAS on how AI um, can and is transforming monitoring of ocean biodiversity. Um, so look forward to that one. Um, yeah, make sure, note of it in your diaries and uh, book a place with the, the Zoom link on the website. Um, yeah, and thanks to everyone for, for attending and thanks again to our speaker. Hope to see you again. Thank you.